Good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Ed Startup Live here. And uh, today we're really excited to have John Katzman with us talking about uh, education entrepreneurship and uh, sharing some of his uh, experiences. So, uh, John, welcome. Glad you're here. Hi, thanks for having me. And uh, as always, for those of you who may be. My Chris Christie. Say again? I'm wearing my Chris Christie fleece here. Oh, that, wait, yeah, way to, way to show support for, uh, for New Jersey there. <laughs> and, and by the way, on that, before we even say anything else, I know there are a number of, uh, of our uh, folks here that have participated that are living in the New Jersey and New York area and hope that uh, you're well and safe today uh, with all of the craziness of the weather. Um, for those of you who are joining for the first time uh, or uh, uh, are interested in participating, remember that we'll use the hashtag EdStartup on Twitter and we'll be following that and that's how we can ask uh, John any questions so just remember uh, Ed Startup as the hashtag there. Um, let's go ahead and get started then uh, and what I'd, I'd love to do is, is as, as we normally do John just give you some time to to talk about yourself and just tell us who you are and, and how you got into the space and what you did and then uh, for the the remaining time we'll just throw questions at you and, and start a good conversation but let's uh, just start from hearing about you. That sounds great. Um, well, I uh, very little to tell actually. I um, founded Princeton Review pretty much while I was in college, uh, and uh, with three thousand dollars and the thought of building a, a company that could support for a couple years my building a software company, and then the review kind of took off, and I went with it, ran it for for many many years, or over twenty years, took it public. Uh, decided that being a public company uh, was not my best destiny. Brought in professional management and started uh, Tutor, which is renamed uh, now To You. Um, ran that for four years. Started to talk about going public and uh, and hitting some real scale, and decided again. Uh, this time, handed off to my COO, and uh, and now am working with Noodle, a startup that I. Uh, uh, Put together a couple years ago. Uh, it's run by other people, but uh, by Joe Morgan, who's a terrific guy, um, and just trying to help out there get get Noodle up to uh, up to launch. John, thanks. And by the way, I'm going to just take this as a, as an opportunity to do a quick uh, uh, plug for Noodle. We had an event uh, recently at the at the White House called Education Data Palooza. There's a number of uh, uh, videos that are up on on the uh, YouTube channel on the Office of EdTech YouTube channel that show uh, the presentations there. But one of the uh, uh, organizations, one of the companies that participated, was Noodle. And there was this problem that we were we were dealing with, and we said, look, there's all these data, all these APIs out there that can be very useful for entrepreneurs uh, but nobody has a list of them anywhere we don't have any good catalog of where of all these all the these AP, all these feeds that can be used to build really great uh, apps and so uh, the folks at noodle stood up and said hey well, well we'll come up with that and so if you uh, go to Google and search for best education API's you're gonna go to a page that uh, the noodle folks created with a whole list of over 150 open you know API's that can be used for building uh, apps and all kinds of great things so close parentheses on my my little advert Advertisement there, but I just wanted to say that that's a really awesome thing that that they're uh, they're doing. Um, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Noodle is? Noodle is uh, Google for education. The idea is that if you're looking for a preschool, a college, a grad school, if you're looking for a French tutor, a negotiating seminar, a video on how to add two fractions, the universal experience is it's a pretty crappy experience. Uh, Google gets 3.5 billion searches a month that are related to education. And 80% of them walk away unhappy, um, and and there's a reason for that. It's 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 pretty complex to do a search. You don't really know what you're looking for. It's not like you're looking for, you know, the Empire State Building, and it can show you where it is. And show, it's it's I want a co-ed school in Ohio that has a football team, right? It, it it's there are amorphous searches that generally take several sessions, and we think we can solve that. We think we can be the the kayak of education, the Zillow. And so, tell me where you're at with that. Where, where is it? Uh, how far along are you? How, how, uh, you know, what happens next? What should, what should people know about where Noodles at? We are just finishing up a uh, very significant raise, uh, our Series A raise, and uh, and shooting for it's in soft launch right now. Uh, you can see it on Noodle.org. But uh, January one, 
we'll do a hard launch and, and really start talking it up. And, and so meanwhile, every day we're working on the interface, working on the data, working on the tools, uh, the social tools and everything else. It's, it's, uh, it's in that great becoming moment. <laughs> So we are we're very excited to see uh, to see that, and we'll be uh, we'll be watching for it, and hope that you'll share back with this group when it's uh, when it's ready for prime time, so we can all go and uh, and play around a little bit and, and see what you've come up with. So that'll be very exciting, John. Okay. Let me go back for a minute then, um, and and have you talk a little bit just back to uh, the Princeton Review, and just talk about uh, what what the approach was there, how, how you know how that became so successful, and also just the fact that we are in a, a world that is. Um, you know, so dominated, I guess you could say, by standardized testing. Uh, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on whether that's an opportunity for folks on this participating in this course that are, you know, looking at startup opportunities, or if it's the sort of thing we should be, you know, going around and trying to replace with something else, uh, you know, instead. I think it's pretty clear we need to have accountability. We need to know who are good teachers, which are good schools, which are good textbooks, which are good ways of teaching middle school Latina kids, like the, the notion that we should just kind of sail on uh, and that all, it's all good or that we can operate from our gut hasn't worked anyplace else, isn't working here. But we've created pretty much um, crappy tests from the get-go. The SAT and ACT are mediocre tests of God knows what. Certainly they don't predict college performance very well. Um, the state tests, all, all 50 of them, you could argue that we're kind of 0 for 50 in terms of really really seeing the test and the assessment uh, uh, regimen as driving improvement. You know, are there kids learning? Are there teachers teaching better because of it? And it's, it's, it's a mixed bag at best. In a lot of states, it's, uh, it's pretty disappointing, the results that we've seen from NCLB and, and, and other efforts. So, so I think there are incredible market opportunities for people who do accountability right, for people who do assessment right. And, and so t talk a little bit about what, what, that, what, what is right look like? What, what are types of things that you would encourage folks out here that may be looking at opportunities in that space to do that would be different than what we may have done for the last however many years? If you think about um, a low stakes test, you're a guy in a white lab coat. You're trying to measure the impact of something without actually affecting the thing itself, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's the mindset of a lot of people who do assessment. And I think you should have a different mindset when you attach stakes to a test. When you start thinking in terms of um, uh, people are going to get fired or people aren't going to go to college or going to go to a different college, everything changes. And the way to measure those tests are not by how precise they are or how accurate or how reliable. It's what do they make people do, right? Are we, are we giving people kind of a push towards doing the things that we all think are pretty important for schools to do? So, so if, you, if you see an accountability system as being measured itself by overall improvement and not the measuring instrument but but the uh, uh, but part of the solution, part of the ecosystem. I think I think you're on the right track. Hmm. So um, thank you, and I think we'll we'll have some questions. I'm starting to see some questions actually coming in that we'll get to in a second. So we'll go to that. But before we jump into questions, uh, John, let me just uh, give you a minute to tell a little bit more about what you did at uh, Tutor, which is now uh, to you. Um, it's a, a company just by the by the nature of what it does that isn't really branded as itself, right? The the brand that everybody knows is the brand of the school that they're taking courses from, and so many people may not know what that model was and and what you did there. So would you just talk a little bit about that, and then we'll shift to some other questions? Of course, and that's exactly why I named Tudor after my dog, Tor. Um, we're a non-brand. It's, it's not important who we are. It's important who USC is or Georgetown. So the notion was, you know, you go back a couple years and all online education pretty much was uh, entry-level stuff or media stuff. There was nothing great. There were no great universities stepping in in full force online. And we thought a lot about that and, 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 
and tried to construct a, a, a solution to that. How do you take an elite school and build a program online that's every bit as good as the one that they offer on campus? So thinking a lot less about can we drive down tuition and more about can we scale up a school? Can we make something that is global and still every bit as good? So the, the concept of it is if, if you're applying to Georgetown, their nursing program, or, or UNC, their, their MBA, you go through their admissions department, it's exactly the same standards as classroom students. So you're getting the same quality of, 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 of dialogue. It's the same professors hired by the university working for there and, and teaching both online and offline. It's the same intellectual property and the IP is owned by the school and, and so the core educational experience is Georgetown. But then you say, well, who's the technology? Who's the funder of this thing? Because building a good program and scaling it up to critical mass is probably a 10 or 15 million dollar exercise. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in search of bandwidth. I ended up in a, in a, in a skating rink, so it's a little noisy. Here. We're, uh, that's we're, glad, we're glad you made it after all the weather that's come up your way, so thank you. It's a little complicated today. Um, the, the, so the notion of... Um, the core educational experience is there, but then there's funding, 10 or 15 million dollars. Tech, instructional designers who we embed on campus working with the faculty so that they don't have to become experts in online learning, they just have to become experts in what they're already expert in. The, the uh, recruiting, student services, job placement, all the internships that have to be done, for instance in a teaching program, getting, we have student teachers right now at about 1400 schools around the world. Um, in, in 40 countries. All of the logistics of putting together a 24-7 online thing, that's us. Um, and, and so uh, the programs have been pretty successful. Uh, so we have four of them already launched, uh, uh, teaching, nursing, social work, and, uh, and business school. We have two in the process of launch, and then a whole bunch of programs coming in behind it uh, uh, coming over the next couple months. So we're, we're pretty excited. Wow, great, thank you. It, it, this has been actually very exciting to watch. So somebody like me who kind of geeks out on watching interesting models, right, the model of providing uh, online learning experiences on behalf of the institution, right, in a way that's probably better than they could provide is a very interesting uh, model. So certainly something uh, I'll, I'll be following closely along the way as well as others, I think. Um, Aaron, let me uh, kick it over to you for a little bit and see if you have uh, sort of questions, thoughts, and then we'll take some of the questions coming in from Twitter. Those of you that uh, are uh, interested in asking questions, remember Ed Startup is the hashtag. We'll move over and start taking some of those questions in just a second. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm interested to know how uh, at the very early stages of Princeton Review, you saw that, I mean, you said you, you set out originally for a software company. And Princeton Review was just sort of a bridge to get you to what you wanted to do originally. That's right. I, I'd be interested. I, you know, I, early in entrepreneurs, well, I should say, early stage entrepreneurs often find really big shifts. And I'm curious ab about that moment of realization when you say, you know, I'm going to do this instead. Like the software company idea, that was dumb. You're probably emotionally connected to it. It was probably something you've been thinking about a lot. Can you ex describe that moment when you said, you know what, this original idea of mine is not so good, this other thing I've been doing, wow, all of a sudden it's a lot better than I thought. I didn't actually have a specific software company in mind, so I hadn't fallen in love with it. Um, but I, I majored for two years in engineering before switching to architecture, and uh, and and I just thought, boy, this, this is a world in which interesting things are happening. Um, the The... The thing about education, and everybody who's an EdTech entrepreneur will tell you the same thing, that it's, it's so compelling. Um, everybody talks about doing well and doing good, uh, but boy, it, it, you can really change people's lives uh, in, in really important ways. And it's a landscape where there's an awful lot of money being spent, $1.4 trillion a year in the U.S., a lot of it very badly. And so you sort of feel like this has got to be, and right now I think it is, a target-rich environment where I should be able to build a business here and uh, change lives. So I, I never, I never had for a moment thought, boy, this this Prince of you thing is really a boring kind of waste of time. I wish I could get through it to get to my software company. I was, I was enjoying it the whole wide, and as it took off, as 
uh, we opened up in Brooklyn and Queens and we started having a lot of students and turning away students and we had students coming in from Hong Kong uh, to study with us you thought boy this this could actually be a real company and and we should just you know push on the gas and and see how far we can take it well, I, I, I like that comment because I think uh, I think entrepreneurship is as much about finding as it is about creating you know it's you, as you're building you do a lot of the good entrepreneurs do a lot of finding and it's when they find those things that they that they then know what how to better create um, yeah, I, so I don't know. Let's Richard. Let's do some of the other questions. I'm sure I'll have more as we go along here. So, so yeah, sounds great. So a couple have come in. First of all, uh, several back to uh, to Noodle, John. So let me uh, go to a couple here. The first one, uh, and this reflects uh, hopefully something that we've been talking about in this class is that we when, when thinking about ideas, right? We're really trying to say what's a pain point? What's a pain point that somebody has, and can you find a solution that's helpful for them? So this is a question from Wendy that says, uh, "How did you identify the need for Noodle, and what do you see as the primary uh, customers and primary sort of need to be met there. You've talked a little bit about that, but if you want to give some more uh, detail on that. Yeah, it, I actually approached it from the other side, which is within Tutor, uh, thinking, boy, there's no good way to reach potential students. Uh, you know, you can, you can buy ads on Facebook, or you can play the SEM game, uh, or, you can, or you can go to the lead gen uh, guys who are mostly marketing DeVry and U Phoenix and Kaplan. But in terms of a marketplace, in terms of a, uh, a venue for a good school to talk about itself globally, there was nothing there. Hmm. And started thinking about that and saying, well, that's true not just here, but it was true at Princeton Review. It's true in any education company. Any VC will tell you, any of the entrepreneurs here will tell you that the toughest thing is getting the audience, is, is, is marketing. Uh, so I looked at it from that side and said, uh, it's mirrored by the frustration of parents and kids to find the right tutor, the right uh, summer camp or after school program or lacrosse coach or uh, video on how to add two fractions. We all talk about con. There are a lot of cons out there and a lot of potential cons. We could have a whole marketplace of great content around any given topic. But the problem is, what's their business model, and how do they find the customer, and how does the, find, the customer find the best Civil War content, the best quadratic equation uh, explanation? Um, and I think, I think it's not huge pain, except perhaps when you're applying to college or grad school, but it's a steady pain. Um, every time you want something, just I, I just need to know this, uh, I just need to tutor in that, uh, you're reminded that it's a, it's a tough search. An LD specialist. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so while while we're th talking about this, let's actually talk a little bit now about the technical aspect of it. So, so if this is the the, the pain piece that you're trying to sort of reach, the solution you're trying to uh, to, to come up with, there are a number of technical uh, architecture standards that are, that come in play that are also trying to help support this. And so, um, Brent has a question uh, about uh, use of LRMI, learning registry, or sort of schema.org. Uh, uh, any any uh, tie-in to any of those standards as part of the work with Noodle? Yeah, we're using, we're connected to all of them, uh, to all the initiatives, and, uh, and as they become more useful, um, we'll be the user. Uh, mm -hmm. Sooner or later, you've got, to take, you've got to take that infrastructure and bring it to the user. And I'm looking for, oh, let's go with, um, you know, some trigonometric identity I'm trying to figure out. Um, how am I going to find it? If, if it's on Google, uh, it might help me with some of the metadata. I, I'm more skeptical about the power data. Um, I think you need a coherent place to dig down into what are you really looking for here? Because a lot of times, kids don't know the Common Core standards, and they don't know how to ask the question a lot of times uh, as to what they're looking for, um, especially once you leave K-12 land and once you leave math and English. And the notion that we can translate what you're thinking uh, through natural language and, and, and through other means into pulling data effectively from those sources. I think, I think those sources, those, those, those initiatives are best combined with your social network uh, and with uh, a user community and with good 
front end uh, to, to actually be effective. Mm -hmm. So, and, and actually that ties in very nicely to another question here, which is uh, about the importance of community and online education. Uh, one of the things here, and this is the, the comment from Twitter here, is about uh, MOOCs tending to struggle with this. Uh, this is a, a, someone who uh, built Get Study Room to try to help fix this. You know from our, our approach with this course, we did not want to take the pre-recorded video approach like so many MOOCs did because we wanted to have this live interaction. So how important is community and how do you help make sure we don't lose that as we move to more online and more massive open courses? I, it's a great question. Um, first of all, in terms of the search, I think social is a huge component. Uh, you know, you're, you're looking at Brown and, well, which of your friends went there or go there or know somebody there who can give you some real authentic information about it? Um, and again, college is, is uh, an area that's pretty well served already. You know, you're looking for a, a high school or you're looking for a tutor. Um, what your friends are doing matters and what your friends think matters. Um, further, when you're hitting an area that is new to you, you know, you, uh, your uh, son is diagnosed with a learning disability, and now you've got to join a community of people who actually are dealing with that successfully, with that particular uh, learning difference, and finding that community and becoming part of it is critical, I think. Um, so, so it's certainly a, a big deal for Noodle. In terms of the MOOCs, uh, if you think about the MOOCs as in the end, creating great um, asynchronous content for a flipped model university, then you start thinking of them as a competitor of Pearson and as a competitor to uh, some of the open uh, educational resource initiatives. Right. So there's a whole bunch of good asynchronous content. At the tutor programs, we marry that to a bunch of synchronous work. You're in a class of 10 students with a great professor, and those students all have similar abilities to yours. Now you go to a different kind of school and they say, well, we want 20 students with an adjunct. And then you go to another school and they say, well, we want 80 students, and it's kind of peer-led. And then you go all the way to, this is a correspondence school. And the, the question of the slippery slope, the question of where where is this not really a university experience anymore? Where is this simply uh, an autodidact having some extra resources? I think is one that the department's going to have to to address in the next couple of years. Uh, I, I think social is everything. So I think one of the things that's pretty interesting here, and, and just to follow up on this question as well, is I think this is a big opportunity from my view, is how do we deal with two pieces of these MOOCs as we, as we deal with massive open courses or just lots more opportunities for online courses. One is how do we have that uh, social interaction piece, but the other is how do we deal with assessment, right? So how do we deal with the fact that you have all the, you know, 140,000 people taking some of these courses, right? And, and how do we in a reasonable way try to assess that there's actually some learning that's happening in, in, in a way that's meaningful for somebody who may hire somebody coming out of that course afterwards. The notion of badges, with all due respect to a lot of good people who are thinking a lot about them, I think is, is vaguely interesting in life learning, but not mm. in any way a replacement for a degree. Uh, it's not a, a replacement for the notion that um, there's a narrative arc to a university, there is a community that you're joining, uh, both socially and uh, uh, and 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 instructionally, educationally, the 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 thought of you know pairing a MOOC to some assessment, whether it's high security or low security, um, isn't that interesting? Even if we could solve the security problem easily, which we can't, and again, as soon as you start adding stakes, people are actually getting hired or not hired on the basis of their grade, that's when the cheating is going to get serious. Um, I think the more interesting road is to say, look, this is just a content provider. The university that uses that asynchronous content has got to marry it to, to real life instruction where the professors know the kids and know, in a sense, wait a minute, that kid could not have created this paper. Um, so you can give them all the great tools, you can do uh, proctored exams, you can do all kinds of things that we do in our program, but the first line of defense is that there's somebody in this course who knows you, 
and who's talking to you all the time and who's and who's probing uh, to see if you actually know anything. Aaron, were you going to jump in? Sorry, yeah, well, it seems like one of the problems that's there with online education and it, particularly getting a lot of this online instruction into classrooms is more of an attitudinal one, right? A faculty member likes to think of himself as the expert and isn't necessarily going to be turning, you know, to someone else or somewhere else because it sort of implies, well, I don't know what I'm talking about well enough to be better than whatever somebody else is stuck online. It, it, that leads me to a broader question. I mean, how do a lot of those trying to start up with new ideas overcome those attitudinal barriers? Because they're everywhere, right? Especially in higher education. Um, you know, if, for example, you talked about standardized testing. I mean, the idea that universities would ditch the ACT or SAT is kind of it's hard to imagine, right? Because it's so deeply entrenched. And so if you want to be the person who disrupts that, I guess my question is where do you even start when it comes to these really deeply entrenched attitudinal barriers? Where do you, where do you begin? Um, in a sense, Mecca, uh, Nirvana is, uh, is selling directly to a kid or a parent. Right, because it's a straightforward transaction. I am helping your son, and you are paying me X. And if you don't feel that's worthwhile, then stop paying me. Um, one level deeper is selling to a teacher who's working on behalf of her kids, um, and that works, but it's hard. And right now, they don't have a lot of money to spend. And then you go to a school who's hiring for their teachers to help the kids, and then you go to a district or a state. And the farther away you get from the kid, the more stakeholders there are that you're trying to please, the less likely it is you're going to create a great product. And from a selling point of view, the bigger the advantage of Pearson, McGraw-Hill, and, and the other large players. Like you uh, in startup land, uh, I think, are always well served trying to stay very, very close to the kid and, uh, and look for solutions that are uh, at worst, selling to the school or selling to the to the to the teacher. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, I guess I could imagine, for example, a way to replace ACT or SAT is to, if you're selling something to the kid that demonstrates his qualities and abilities that maybe the ACT doesn't reveal, the evidence is so obvious there for university that they sort of have to recognize it for its value. I don't know what that would be, but that, that you make. Going. Yeah, if I were going after ACT, ACT and SAT, I would actually start with the PSAT and PLAN, which are practice tests that are huge profit centers for both of them. Um, they don't have stakes. I don't have to worry about pleasing colleges. All I have to be is predictive of your actual SAT or ACT score. And, and the less expensive, more easily accessed for schools, easier to administer, um, I, th I think actually that there's a uh, the the Kamchatka, the place you enter that space, might be there. Uh, tough to go spikes up just directly addressing uh, uh, the SAT and ACT because there's a lot of infrastructure around those scores. Uh, ACT is arguably a better product. It's taken them I don't know 50 years to get to parity uh, uh, nationally. Um, you know, and they're not stupid people. It's a, that's a tough. That's a tough road. John, let me jump in and uh, throw a couple questions that we've gotten on Twitter. Uh, a couple related to uh, to to you or Tudor. Um, one is a question from Joseph. You're wondering, uh, did you regret the fact that you offered exclusives to each type of program? Uh, and the question is, did that limit growth, or did you even have a choice? I didn't. Uh, I don't regret it at all. I mean, it was fiercely argued. Uh, within the company and with investors, um, but it was the right move. The, the fact is, we're not a tech platform, right? We're a partner, and there's not a single system at, at a major research university built for a 24-7 a, a online environment. And so you're working with them on a lot of their innards, you know, and you're really digging down into the school to, to help them streamline, to help them figure out how to service their, uh, their campus-based students, their online students, how to make it an experience that's truly great, to do that while also working with their competitors, I don't think you'd have the trust to get it done. And, 
And I think you'd, you'd be spending an awful lot of time uh, dealing dealing with politics and dealing with uh, uh, with with weird kind of intersections. I have this great idea at three in the morning. Do I give it to Georgetown or do I give it to Duke? You know, I I don't want to be in that situation. Gotcha. Thanks. And so another question, and this is specific to Tudor, but I'm going to actually open it up. So Jacob uh, says, uh, is there anything that you would have done differently at the beginning of Tudor or uh, in, in retrospect you would have changed? And so I would just open it up in addition to just Tudor. In general, are there any things that you would have, in hindsight, you said, well, that was really not the right approach. Anything you would have done differently? Huh, a million things. Tudor has been a remarkable ride because the company's more or less grown the way we thought it would, that the challenges we thought we'd have, we have, the things that we thought would be easy were easy. Um, I brought together a bunch of pretty senior people who I had a lot of faith in and, uh, and who justified that faith, uh, especially on the technology and content side. The, I look at my experiences in, in not just these three companies, but in spinning off a bunch of other companies. Tutor.com, T-U-T-O-R, uh, was originally a Princeton View thing that uh, we brought in George Segal uh, to build. Um, one of the things I feel strongly about is that everybody pushes the notion of a lean startup. And I'm kind of in favor, especially in the education space, of a pudgier startup that you, you got a lot of companies where there's one guy with good vision and then a bunch of 20-somethings who are going to work hard but who don't have deep experience in the education space and they don't have deep experience in the business space and so you end up with uh, uh, an awful lot of wasted time and money whereas if you pull together a good mix of people who understand education who understand business you create a company that has both a soul and a clue and that's harder than you think. Um, I think you have a shot at building something here. This is a this is a space that's pretty unforgiving. Um, it's a heavy trust kind of exercise, and there's just not the same kind of room to to run and gun uh, in in the way that a consumer market might have. And so you've clearly been successful at doing this, and, and like you said, it is a, it is a difficult space. Any any advice in particular on how do you get the right people? How do you, if you're going to be a little pudgier, how do you make sure you get the right uh, uh, sort of robustness in, in terms of talent involved from the beginning? It's all about the team, right? So nobody's going to walk in with a complete set of experiences. But if you're attacking, and I don't suggest you do, the district space. Um, you need people who have been in the belly of that beast who really understand districts and how they work and the politics of districts, especially the larger ones. But you also need people who have a good, strong business background, who have built companies from scratch and taken it to scale. And, uh, and if you have one and not the other, I, th I think you're going to miss the boat. And I don't think you're going to find a lot of people with both from the get-go. Aaron, did, were you going to jump in? I thought I saw you saying something. If not, I'll go take another question here. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, uh, th this leads to an even broader question, which is, um, and one that uh, Richard and I had discussed previously, is this idea of failure, right? I mean, how do you, when you're, when you're heading into a space, how do you learn from failure? You know, this is a question we can't ask everybody that comes into the, our, our course because uh, they're early and still going through that, but you've been through many startups now, and what lessons have you taken away about failure and how to deal with failure as you're building towards success? I, I think the reality is for a lot of for a lot of startup entrepreneurs, failure is 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 a bad word. It's it's bad mojo. You just want to stay away from talking about it, engaging with it, experiencing it. And uh, I think you being on the other end, where a lot of people hope to be, it'd be great to get your feedback on that concept. So I switched my major to architecture, and. Uh, you don't really think about failure. You draw something, and then you put a piece of trace paper or the electronic equivalent, and then you keep the things you like, and then you layer on new gestures. There's this sense that uh, you iterate constantly that I, that I, I think is true of, of, of architecture and it's true of startups. Rather than see them as failures, I just say, well, this is what's working, this isn't working, let's swap out this, let's try this over here. Um, let's, try to, let's try not to screw up the things that work while we address the things that don't. Um, 
there are people who say fail quickly, and I would just say iterate quickly uh, is, is, is the way you got to think of it. There, there comes a time to pivot, but in between now and then is an awful lot of time to just tweak, to just say, yeah, you know, we've got the product right, we've got the marketing wrong, or we've got the sales wrong, or, you know, maybe we misunderstand how the market's going to buy this. I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of startups. I invest in, 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 a, in a bunch of tech startups. And they're like five degrees off. And we have these huge drinking, come to Jesus conversations of just saying, like, you could do this. And there's like billions of dollars going against that space badly, and you could make impact. But you're doing this, and we should talk in two months when you realize that's not working. You know, and then sooner or later, we, you know, we have the next conversation. So, entrepreneur, look, to be an entrepreneur, you have to be stubborn. Sorry, so sorry, I keep going. You, Didn't mean to cut you off there. To be an entrepreneur, you have to be pretty stubborn, and I expect that. But you also have somebody, you have to have people with a two by four every so often to whack some sense in you. So, I, well, let's go a little deeper on that. What I was going to jump in and say there was, I, I forgot to mention as we've talked about your role and what you've done, in addition to starting these successful companies, you also are an angel investor in the space. And uh, are there um, repeated themes that that you see where you feel like you, that are making you grab that two by four? You know, are there things where you see, look, if one, <laughs> if I see this one more time, you know, co common mistakes that, that you see over and over again as people are starting in this space? Um. You you mentioned one of them, which is uh, what's the what's the need? What's the pain point that you're addressing? And people with solutions that are nice to haves, but then expecting somebody to pay for a nice to have, whereas education is already pretty expensive. You really want to start with a need to have. Um, number two. Um, there are an awful lot of people who before they've really vetted the concept against people before they're like in that whole process of iterating spend an awful lot of time thinking you know sort of like a lot of people with a banking industry background like they go off they pull the all-nighter they've done all the research this is the answer whereas the right answers tend to be collaborative tend to be bouncing it off people back and forth molding it um, and uh, and and picking kind of a winding path through a minefield uh, versus just saying I'm I'm going to just plow that way, uh, which which has a expected result. Yeah, I think this idea of uh, sort of the, as quickly as possible getting something that you can get feedback on too is also very helpful. I, I know I've uh, told a story. I was involved in the education game startup uh, a, a little while ago, and we went and had a bunch of kids that we were going to demonstrate some uh, software to, and uh, worked a lot on building and developing this product, and uh, sat in front of them, and, and the people that we were helping us with this usability said, uh, you, you can't use anything electronic. We said, well, we have it. You know, we have this prototype made. And they said, no, you can only use uh, Post-it notes, and you can make sounds. And we we sort of grumbled and were frustrated and we said we know if we didn't have anything maybe we'd do that but we actually have a product and anyway at the end of the day we said look we'll do it so we set up these post-it notes and sat down and made the sounds you know as the kids pushed on the what were supposedly the buttons and found out that the way they actually liked interacting with this design that we'd made was very not at all like what we'd programmed right and so we discovered sort of very quickly in, in the case and this was working with third graders right who 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 quickly showed us that what we'd been working on for a month was not right uh, and so it was a very painful mem you know experience for me that I'll never forget which is very very quickly get feedback and don't spend so much time thinking uh, about it before you actually have something real to put in front of people and so I, I think that's a good good lesson to take you're, across everything you're, you're totally right when at Princeton Review we would have these deep discussions about some marketing strategy, uh, some ad, and uh, and we would get behind the glass, hire a good uh, moderator, and have a series of one-on-ones. So two days of kids coming in every hour and just talking about that thing, uh, looking at, at different concepts that we, that we had uh, created. And we would sit behind the glass, and within like three kids, it was over. It was over. Yeah. It was, oh my God, I didn't see it this way. You're totally right. I'm totally wrong. We've got to move on. And then you start like scribbling furiously and changing the game and trying to come up with something that's going to uh, uh, be better yet. Since you have an extra hour, a day and a half of uh, of time to kill, uh, incredibly effective to to just with an open mind listen to your users. Yeah.
Yeah. So that's actually, uh, I'm going to just jump to a question here that relates to that. So Wendy says, you know, there are many of us here uh, with deep education experience that would be open and happy to give that knowledge freely to ed startup community, you know, ed startups and uh, folks that are building this space that would listen to the frustrations and try to solve. So um, this may not be an easy question to answer, John, but I'm wondering, how, how do we do that? I mean, I, I hear this question over and over again, not just from Wendy, but from others who say, look, we know a whole bunch of issues and problems that we're dealing with all day, every day. Nobody's asking us <laughs> what the problems are, right? We, we don't know how to communicate those. So is there a way that we can do a better job of taking folks like Wendy who have you know, pain points that they could use some help solving with people who are actually positioned to look for problems to solve? Um, it's a really interesting question. I mean, the, uh, I'm on a bunch of advisory boards from companies where I'm not on the, on the board of directors. Um, to some degree, uh, it's, it's tough to imagine it as a drive-by. Um, uh, I, I would advise any startup to put together some advisory group. Uh, it's an it's an interesting question. If you could share an advisory group, if you could come together with another couple of tech firms, if the department could be useful in in helping pair uh, a, a team of entrepreneurs uh, with it with 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 both people in K twelve and higher ed. Uh, educators and at the same time uh, uh, business people who could, who could give uh, th their viewpoint as well. Um, but yeah, I, I the first thing we did at Tudor is we set up an advisory board for the MAT of great teacher training, uh, teacher professional development folks around the country and uh, we're doing the same thing now at Noodle for each one of our areas for college admissions. We're the best people to think about how do I get in the head of a parent or a kid uh, you know, for, for learning disabilities, for anything. Um, so I'm always looking for validation and, and, and ideas, people, people who are smart to bounce ideas off of, and anybody who can help on that, that's interesting. John, one of the things that we've been looking at doing um, at the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Education, you've actually been involved in this and have been very helpful along the way, is saying is encouraging people to uh, work in, in regions, right, region-based uh, activities. So look for entrepreneurs in your area, look for researchers in your area, look for schools in your area, and try to work together and strengthen as a region some of the, the work that you're doing. We actually, um, I noticed uh, Joseph South was on here earlier. He helped uh, us with an event in, in Utah recently where we, we were trying to pull people together to accelerate innovation there. And so one just general suggestion, I know, Wendy, I think this is a, 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 a good question and a somewhat tricky question that you ask. We don't have a simple answer. But one thing that I would offer is, is get to know the folks that are in your area. There are often times where you have a university with professors that are working on exactly a, a line of research that a company in the same region is building a product around, and, uh, and there's no connection between the two. And so any ways that at a regional level we can start to just build those connections and relationships, I think, is uh, as a helpful step forward. I'd also look at conferences like uh, the South by Southwest EDU, like Michael Moe's uh, work at ASU. Uh, there are a couple of conferences that bring together an awful lot of people in this space, the New Schools Venture Fund uh, Conference, um, that, that during certain times of the year you have a huge concentration of people who are knowledgeable about this space. Uh, and 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 some ways to tap into it. Yeah, very hard to say no to somebody who you meet at one of these conferences. Says, "Hey, can I can I take fifteen minutes of your time?" It's a lot easier to blow off an email. So one other thing I would mention too, and I'll, uh, uh, open this as an invite to everybody who's participating, is that we're looking at and thinking about how we can make it easier for people participating in this MOOC to connect and collaborate with each other. So we do have researchers, we do have startups, we do have uh, uh, a variety of uh, levels of different technical skills. And so anybody who's here, please feel free to shoot uh, Aaron or David or I an email afterwards. And if there are ways that we can do a, a better job of helping each other, that are you know everybody participating in this link up, we're happy to do that as well. And so uh, we'll be part of coming up with a solution to, to this uh, challenge. Aaron? Yeah, so um, can I change uh, topics now with another question? Sure. Uh, John, so uh, you fit in an especially rare category, and that's the category of successful serial entrepreneurs. That is, you've done something, and then you went on and did another thing that was successful. Um, 
there's a there are quite a few successful entrepreneurs who drop off after that first one. You probably know a lot of them. I, I'd be curious to get your opinions on why that happens. Why is it that some entrepreneurs hit it the first time and then blow it the second time? And uh, what advice can you give to everybody listening now that might help them both with their first time around and maybe their second or third time around? There's an awful lot of ego. Um, as, as you build a company and it scales, um, it's easy to start believing you're the smartest guy in the room. And, uh, and actually, it was pretty useful. Uh, uh, being a terrible public company CEO uh, took, took me back to, uh, to a much humbler state of mind. And I think you have to walk into a startup with that humility. I think you have to walk in saying, boy, you know, I got to learn here uh, rather than teach. So how do you balance that, that humility then with the fact that you, you're bringing expertise that other people don't have? You've got an idea, you've got a background, experience, knowledge, you've gained, gathered, you know, information that makes you uniquely valuable. How do you balance that expertise with the humility you need to be able to hear and listen? Uh, it's there's a lot of drinking involved. Um, you know, you put together a team and and during the day there's certain conversations you want to have and you want to really leave people alone, like hire the right guy and let him do his job. And the conversations you want to have that are difficult, they think somebody's heading off uh, in a wrong direction um, with their people, with their customers, uh, sometimes are better had after work over a beer, uh, just saying, hey, you know, how do you think about this? And, you know, I'm getting a feeling about this, and let's talk about it. And people have their guard a lot lower. You're not under fluorescent lights. You're not all caffeinated and ready for, uh, ready for an argument. Um, but it's hard. I, I, I think that is tough. And, again, it's also tough if you haven't brought together a team uh, of people you really trust. If it's, if it's one guy who knows the space and a bunch of, of, of good, smart kids, um, you end up being the teacher all the time and, and, and slipping back into that mindset. And so related to that, a lot of the people who are participating in the course with us this semester are seed stage. I mean, they're just right at the beginning of what they're doing. What advice do you have for them as they approach angel investors? I mean, because it's the same problem, right? You're going to an angel who doesn't have the expertise you have. You're trying to sort of help them understand. They're going to be coming back to you, peppering you with questions. A lot of those questions will reflect a misunderstanding of the subject area. How do you sort of manage that interaction with an angel where you don't maybe get, because I've seen a lot of, of seed, start, seed stage groups get very frustrated with angels. Their opinion is, oh, they're just stupid. It's not the right person. And the point is they're kind of going about the wrong way. So how do you recommend that, that, that these seed stage groups approach the angels when they're trying to get that first, that first level of funding? David Rose explained this to me pretty well. Um, you know, when you, when you do the math, you realize that an angel investor who knows what he's doing is really looking for a 30 times return. You know, you're going to invest in a bunch of companies. Most of them aren't going to make it. Um, and if you want any kind of return, a 20% return that justifies doing this, um, you have to believe this company can scale up a lot. Um, so, so first of all, understand the metrics you're dealing with. You know, the valuation you're looking for right now, multiply it by 30 and say, is there a reasonable expectation that eight years from now I can get to that point? Um, number two is the story should be simple, something you can tell in a minute, which is, A, there's a big market, and, and have some real numbers behind that market that, that pass a giggle test, and B, there's a real need in that market and an opportunity here, and then C, I've got a solution that that can address that market and disrupt it. Um, and then I've got a team that can execute that solution. And there are two more parts of it. Uh, is what you're doing defensible? If you get any traction at all, is the obvious answer that you're going to sell to Pearson for $30 million and not get a great return? Or, you know, that's, a nice, that's a lovely return, but will it be enough? Um, is that the is that the maximum upside that you get to a certain scale and you get bought, or worse, that they just spend a couple hundred thousand dollars, do what you did, and then crush you like a bug? 
And then finally, that you really know your numbers. And, uh, and the number of presentations I see from entrepreneurs who really haven't done the math, who really, like you look at their financial analysis of what this company is going to look like and how much we're going to spend and what the product is going to cost and what the margin on that product is going to be and how it goes. Um, you know, most of the pitches I see don't have uh, uh, some, some, some relatively sophisticated Excel work. And I think, I think that pays off. It might not be that that's where the company goes and you're going to evolve the model a lot, but it shows your thinking, it shows the clarity of your thinking, that you can, that you can sort of make some guesses, expose those guesses, and say, if, if my guesses are right, here's what the company looks like. Well, and so the the whole pro forma issue, I, I think that scares a lot of people off. I have this great idea, but I don't know accounting. I don't know how to do a pro forma. Where do you recommend that they start to so that when they go to the investor, they're passing the giggle test, like you said? There, there are a lot of people who know how to put together a good spreadsheet, and uh, and it doesn't have to be sophisticated. Really, what you're looking at is is unit economics. You know, one kid. Uh, what does it cost me to acquire a user or a customer, and what am I going to end up both on the revenue side and on the on on, on the on the gross profit side? You know, how much am I going to get uh, from a successful completion of that of whatever I'm doing for them? And in a sense, you want to have a multiple of two or three, right? Your your profit on that kid, and at the end of the day should be two or three times what you spent getting them. And, and that ratio and that notion of I can bring it down to a student, what it costs me and what, it, and, 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 and what I'll get, is, is a starting point for any good pro forma. And then everything else is, 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 is pretty straightforward. Well, and, and I really want to emphasize that point. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of student social entrepreneurs, and, and they don't even understand their unit. Like they have an idea for a venture of some kind, and they don't even know what their unit is to calculate their unit economics. And that's one of the things that I have to help them go through. I think for everybody listening, if you don't know what your unit is for your venture, that's one of the first places to start to figure out what you're doing, because you'll never build a business model without understanding that. So that's great advice. Thanks. Back to you, Richard. I, I Long line of questions, sorry. No, thanks so much. No, very, very, very helpful. Um, so, John, I'm just looking at, uh, we're getting close to the end of the uh, time here. So, uh, what I wanted to do is just ask you the question that we uh, ask everybody who, who comes on here, uh, which is, uh, where do you see the opportunities now? If you were, you know, talking to a whole bunch of uh, start you know, entrepreneurs that are just getting started in this space, which you are, uh, uh, where, where do you see the low-hanging fruit? Where do you see the places that you would suggest people start looking at and focusing on as they consider what ideas they look at for their potential companies? Well, here are a couple. Uh, you, you spoke about the MOOCs, and, and this is one. I think the growth of the MOOCs are going to create some interesting opportunities. Uh, one that comes to mind is working with universities to best, to best move to a flipped model. And if, and if you think about all the sources of asynchronous content, the one I didn't mention and the most important one is the faculty becomes a a source of of source of asynchronous content also, and b a curator of both their material and everybody else's material to create a course to create the asynchronous part of a course. They need a lot of help doing that, and I think that there's going to be a marketplace of companies working with schools to manage this huge flow of great asynchronous materials and use it effectively to drive down tuition and to drive up quality. Um, so that's that's one space I think is interesting. In the K-12 space, I would stay far away from school districts. Um, it's promising. You look at it, you say, well, that's where the money is. A, I think that the era of school districts might be ending, and maybe that's wishful thinking, but uh, but I think there are a bunch of, uh, of economic uh, drivers of that. Um, and stick to things selling to the, to the teacher and to the school um, and, uh, and, and I put as part of that thinking, um, uh, Joe Cohn at Lore, uh, terrific guy, and, and he's building an LMS that doesn't sell to a school, that sells to the professor or to the kid. And if you think about that mindset, he's saying, look, the consumer internet is so much more sophisticated 
the tools that you use every day, like Google Maps, are so much better than any student information system or uh, 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 a VRP solution that what's going to happen to the SIS is it's going to shrink down to basically a, a, a group of APIs sitting on a database and and more and more of the services will be provided at the, at, the, at the professor level, at the student level, at the administrator level and it's a really interesting mindset but if I was if I was hitting ed tech in the university space or in the K-12 space I would look for solutions along those lines. I think he's onto something. Um, in terms of the tutoring space uh, I think there's some real opportunities there that some people are starting to pursue, but real tutoring, not drive-by, but developing a deep relationship with a kid, using online tools, uh, I think nobody's really uh, won the game yet. Um, gosh, there are a whole bunch of ideas. The whole brain plasticity movement, um, starting with um, fast forward and scientific learning, who unfortunately is stuck with a district selling model that just doesn't work. Um, I think direct-to-consumer products that help you see better, read better, hear better, um, I think the next 20 years is going to be rife with those. And there's research being done all over the place, but very, very little um, of that research is being brought to market. John, thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing that and I think giving us some great, great feedback and thoughts as, as certainly uh, we consider what where opportunities are and, and helping uh, folks that are participating in this course to, to consider what their, their space is here and how they're going to add their unique talent. So uh, thank you. And also, let me just say in addition, I know that uh, we mentioned it here at the beginning, but uh, the fact that you <laughs> go in search of bandwidth to be able to get on this in, in addition to a normally very busy schedule to actually find a place that has power and, and uh, connectivity. Thank you. And we hope you're back to having power and, uh, and your own bandwidth very soon. Um, John Katzman, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.